is up, Shark Nation. Welcome to the podcast this week. Uh, we're delighted to have our new friend, Jennifer Herrahan. Hello. Thank you. <laughs> okay, I think I got, I, got the, I got the second name right. We had a little bit of a discussion beforehand, um, but we have uh, cleared that minefield. Mark Baker is still in Glenageary. How's it going, Mark? Good. Good to be here as always. Welcome, Jennifer. Thanks, Mark. So, Jennifer, it's, I, I've, I've got to kick off this. Great. You're in West Cork right now. We were just talking before this uh, the podcast started. We were talking about um, how things have changed a little bit with the corona stuff. Uh, people are doing a lot of stuff uh, online. Um, but there was thing, one thing I wanted to get off my chest um, when I speak to somebody from Cork. I have never been to Cork City or a lot of West Cork at all. And my Cork friends, they find that the, you know, repulsive. So what, are we, what we've, we've done is we're going there next week. We're going to West Cork. We're going to Cork City. And me and my wife, we're going to take a whole kind of holiday out there. So. Luke, you just saved the podcast. Yeah. Like, I don't know if I would have been in the position to proceed. No, um, look, every everyone in Cork has caught, you know, the bug. Everyone from Cork has caught that bug of, of loving Cork. But um, yeah, it's a great city. Like, so I'm, I'm delighted that you're going to make the trip because, um, uh, yeah, I feel very lucky to be down here. You know, um, I, I converted um, my apartment space into office space in Dublin. But I was just, once the restrictions were lifted, I was just dying to get down the road and get some fresh air in. So, um, yeah, you it's good. To go. Sorry? Are you near the coast in West Cork? Yeah, really lucky. You can actually, from like the field uh, behind my house, you can see three lighthouses. So okay. it's, well, you know, it's a pretty steep incline, but um, and we're actually four miles inland. So um, some, sometimes refer to, I'm from a little village called Rina Screena, um, and, but I always, our nearest sort of um, settlement is Clonakilty, and that's super, um, it's, it's super popular for the black pudding and, and lots of other things. So I often kind of like pin Clonakilty as, you know, if anyone's coming down or... Drop in yeah. there. Cool. All right. Well, so I, uh, <laughs> <laughs> for the listeners, uh, um, Jennifer is a uh, CEO and founder of Othello. Um, it is uh, a piece of technology uh, aimed at the, the legal industry, if I'm uh, if I'm correct. Um, and it's something that we were we've been we've been looking or uh, following uh, Jennifer's career lately, trying to uh, see if we can get some time to talk to her on the Shark Pod. So we're delighted to have her here. Um, so like. This is, it's an interesting one for me as well, because we talked about, we had Graham Kenny on the, on the podcast a little while ago, um, and shout out to Graham Kenny. Hopefully we don't lose, lose touch, Mark, what do you think? No, 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 I'm staying in touch, definitely. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, so the, he, he was uh, told us all about kind of the, the legal professional in Ireland, um, for people who were trying to get into that. Um, so I'm, I'm interested to learn how you went from uh, being a solicitor or um, you know, on a, a certain path that's quite laid out for a lot of people, they try yeah. to do the partner thing, and then go, going into tech. But maybe we might start uh, at the beginning, um, where you went to college, what happened after college, all that type of stuff. Okay, cool. So, um, yeah, I mean, I was born and raised in the country on a farm, and um, I guess my first job was probably a bit of part-time farming and um, some waitressing locally, and all of that. And I was sort of like dipped in and out of the idea of going to university. Um, I really enjoyed some of my first jobs working in food and in kitchens and the retail hospitality industry. And, but then I kind of like started taking the leaving so seriously and writing a little bit and, and things like that. And a career guidance teacher mentioned me, but I considered law. Um, and, you know, I sort of, I, I, I put it down there with, I think, together with like English and history. So they were sort of my interests that I was like developing as I was going along. And you kind of catch the bug a little bit because uh, I really, it got, it, I almost like was studying English for my leaving search to the exclusion of everything else. Um, and then it just, you know, when, when the opportunity came around to study law at, at UCC, um, I kind of thought, okay, why not? Um, and... I, you know, my first year of study was, was actually really difficult because it was the first time I had ever lived um, in an urban area. Uh, I was very lucky to have college accommodation. Uh, any of my friends will remember uh, our houses along College Road fondly, but uh, college accommodation, you know, within a stone's throw of, of uh, the old gates of UCC. So extremely privileged position to be in uh, with 10 hours of reading um, at law in UCC. But I really did struggle for the first year. Um, and maybe it was because, you know, I, 
didn't really know where the studies of law would take me. I was sort of um, just full of, I guess, energy for life and trying lots of different things. And law can actually be quite, you know, trite, uh, you know, to, to do it right, you know, the study and application and everything can be very, um, it can be very serious. I mean, I was landed into these lecture halls studying constitutional law and contract law, kind of looking around me going, does anyone else think this is uh, strange? You know, um, but but I settled in and, and I don't know what that sort of um, initial kind of speed bump was, but um, I struggled with my first year um, in, 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 in college as well. I remember taking out the Oxford Law Dictionary, you know, a couple of weeks before the exam, just like run, running through it and trying to catch up on lost reading hours and everything else. And and then I got through first year and, and uh, I sort of, a friend of mine actually had a chat with her. I was like, I don't know where this study is going or anything like that. Uh, you know, uh, maybe I should take a gap year. And, you know, I was just sort of like all over the place. And uh, I remember she said to me, listen, you know, this is just a really strong degree. It's, it's going to, you know, shape your life, um, if not your career, in, in really interesting ways. Just stay in the saddle, uh, stay there, stay with it. And I'm really thankful that I had that chat with her uh, because I was about to drop out and, um, you know, explore the things and I stuck with it. And um, and again, maybe kind of like the same as the leaving cert thing, I, I caught the bug a little bit and I started just applying myself, really, really getting into it. Ended up, um, you know, getting, I was very lucky to be awarded a placement in Luxembourg in a commercial law firm in the third year of my studies. And that was a real inflection point for me because I could see this really exciting world um, where, you know, being a lawyer or working within the legal industry was a very interesting place where business and life intersects. And uh, often some really chaotic stuff happens and then other times uh, just some sort of more mundane um, technical things happen, but it seemed like a challenge that I was gonna be up for. And so I started taking it seriously from there. And I came back from Luxembourg um, in, sorry, I'm really on a tangent here. You probably uh, have to start. No, no, this is great. Um, yeah, yeah. Great. so um, I came back from Luxembourg being completely blind to uh, the global recession that was going on because I was working on a huge transaction over in Luxembourg and basically living in a, a bubble. Uh, the transaction was all that me and the other uh, lawyers or interns uh, or partners were working on at the time. And so although I was aware, I wasn't quite um, well aware enough of, of how bad uh, the state of the economy was at the time. And so I made applications to all of the, the top commercial law firms for training contracts without having done any entrance exams or passed my final year studies or anything like that. And I think, I don't know if ignorance is bliss or, you know, um, you don't know what you don't know, but I just went ahead and, and, and secured a training contract with um, a great a leading Irish commercial law firm um, in, in the middle of a recession. And that was just sort of the impetus for me then to go on and do my entrance exams and do those further little additional studies that you need to do to sort of commence your training. And so uh, early in my 20s, um, I, I started early and, um, you know, a really... Uh, when I think back, I, I was probably quite green. I was probably quite young going into a lot of the transactions and situations that I was thrown into. But uh, kindly and, and perhaps uh, slightly out of necessity, uh, you know, the partners that were, you know, managing a lot of these transactions at the time at the firm I was working in sort of gave me agency on autonomy in a way, you know, like there were certain things where I was actually, you know, allowed to kind of say, right, well, I'm going to drop this contract and, you know, it will be checked through a few checks and balances, but it was, um, I felt myself like I was given really, really interesting, challenging work under the right level of supervision. And that, that in, allowed me to learn an enormous amount. Uh, I think that the type of things that you just don't learn from, uh, you know, doing a master's or, or, you know, studying, you know, in more depth and technical, uh, matters, um, uh, and such like so you know it, it was uh, th that was a really interesting time it was also a very busy time I think you know some of my friends were probably like um what are you doing and in, in what 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 is it that you're actually doing you know at, at eight o'clock at night when you know that we had planned like something or other but 
And, and the answer really is, and I suppose it is one of the, one of the, the, the reasons why um, I, I, I founded Othello, was that, um, you know, despite best efforts and despite, you know, the, the legal uh, system being ripe with some amazing minds, amazing brains and people who can really, really find uh, solutions, um, you know, a lot of the tools uh, that, that, that um, are at the disposal of lawyers and other people involved in the provision of legal services are gravely outdated. There is a real dendritic uh, pattern of inefficiencies uh, within the provision of legal services. And that is not the fault of the lawyers. Uh, like I, I actually, um, and, and, and that's the reason why, you know, time is a currency is sort of there's there's a there you know you're charging on the hour in a law firm and, and the hours are racking up and up but there are innumerable tasks to be done in in you know filing court documents for example it's adding you know so much additional pressure and strain onto the job of a lawyer and yet it's it's very high-end technical um uh, work that lawyers are doing and it's saturated with risk. So there's this sort of like melange of, of things that contribute to the fact that lawyers are extremely hard working and often I would say a little hard done by. Uh, I won't say that for like, you know, for every case, obviously, but, um, you know, nobody thanks the lawyers, right? Uh, you know, I, I saw during, um, during uh, the lockdown, I love the Google Doodles, you know, they you have these like really interesting uh, when you go to Google something like animations and stuff and there were tributes to frontline workers and lots of other professionals and the lawyers aren't mentioned and that is because, you know, through for, for very understandable reasons, the provision of legal services is can be un unsatisfactory in, in the eyes of many people, even though it can involve you know some of the most important life and company events and um, yeah, every thing in your life. It's yeah. very you know there has to be and if you get married or buying a house or you know if someone you know passes away, the, the lawyers are kind of always in the background. So um, that's a really good point. Right. Yeah, and, and often like partaking in whatever you have going on in a very, you know, heartfelt uh, manner, in a re really hardworking manner. And yet I do think that because of various factors and um, there's a constant despondency between the law and the Internet, for example. So even in the last five or ten years, like the provision of legal services is below the mark. And, you know, in terms of, you know, efficiencies and turnaround and all of the rest, and, and that leads to a, lot, a great deal of frustration. And, and I, I think one of the reasons why Othello was founded was to try to bridge the gap, uh, you know, be, between that a little. Um, so, so, yeah, and, I, and then I, I was admitted to the role of solicitors in 2015. I'm going to wrap, wrap that question up super okay. quick. Okay. <laughs> I was admitted to the role of solicitors in 2015. And, um, and then I just got a flavour for, you know, some kind of niche areas of law um, within commercial practice, like... Um, employment um, and pensions, liabilities and ben benefits and a lot of commercial and banking and contracts and stuff like that. And then um, so th this foreboding to sort of do something um, with technology and the law was sort of always there in the background and uh, just came to fruition in 2016. It's, it's such an interesting thing as well, because it seems like we, me and Mark talked about this during the week because um, I had, a, I had a, a, a new software idea that you know maybe we can talk about you know how to get that developed but anyway uh, but it's, it came out of a frustration as well where I was trying to get something done for work um, but there was no like there was a, a big gap here and you're like why isn't someone why isn't there just lots of competitors in this space to do this for us you know and um, so I, I understand that but when you were say when you're in your early 20s and you're working till eight o'clock every day um, are you like at that stage do you think that your your career is going to be in law where you'll be you know, 25 years working in that at that stage? Or are you kind of like, you know? Yeah, there's, there's a constant uh, struggle, you know, in the back of your mind with that because you invest enormous amounts of time to, um, you know, do the entrance exams and all of this kind of thing. And, you know, sometimes, arguably, so, some of the exams are more like a memory test. I think there's a great deal more to be done to ensure that lawyers are, uh, you know, not just tested on application and technical application of the law, but, but far broader range of things. But, 
notwithstanding that, you know, you do invest enormous amounts of time in actually just getting to the place of, you know, being admitted to the role or whatever. And so you're almost like, you know, for the investment of time um, and for the amount of Red Bull that you've drank, uh, you know, you're kind of like, okay. Uh, but uh, no, I, I think um, always bubbling in the back of my mind, there was probably some sort of entrepreneurial uh, spirit there um, but you know I would have explored I, I definitely would have seen myself um, working at a commercial law firm for a bit longer than, than I had done but Othello came along and then maybe one or two other influential people that I met um, just sort of pushed me into it as well and then it just yeah. happened that way you know. So let's talk about that transition then so you you were you had the idea or you had the frustration of um, all of the the, the technical stuff around what you were doing was uh, taking up more time than you think it should have. Um, and then what I was, this is where I was interested in. What happens when you have the idea and then the execution? Is there lots of uh, research online to see if there's something like this or um, how do I build this? Or do you have yeah. any technical background yeah. that you're trying to tell us about? <laughs> Um, the, I suppose you teach yourself a lot of those things when you, you're, you become extremely passionate and obsessed about an idea, then you sort of like the rest of it, like somehow, uh, falls in, into place. Um, but you know, around uh, 2015, I just started, um, you know, looking at the, like the matrix of kind of like paperwork that is involved in like any given transaction or uh you know life or company event as I'd say it or appearance in court or whatever and the divergence and you know between the execution of all of these different types of documents because law is actually surprisingly cultural um you know the the the, the way a document is executed is so different you know across the world um, and it often leads to these time gaps and delays and, and all of these things. So I started like touching on that, looking at that. And the, the and, and of course, paperwork is just sort of like the low hanging fruit, I believe, you know, because it's, you know, substrates like uh, face to face and biros and actual bits of paper. Um, you know, there's far superior ways of ensuring the security and execution of a document now. You know, the in infrastructure of the internet has, and had done, you know, even at, at 2015, been more than adequate, you know, to facilitate better ways of doing things. So I started looking at it and sort of at the top of the chain were um, documents that required um, a third party officer of the court or lawyer in order to execute them. So that would be like notary services or hence the, you know, the name of the company, Othello. Traditionally, you would have had to maybe swear on your mother's life or in the courts of equity and, and, and you know, back in historical days. Although if you're to test me on the exact like years and, and all of that, you'll be disappointed. I just do know that, that that's how it would, made its way into the statute books. Um, because there is this requirement globally, uh, you know, to have a sort of a, a qualified and specialized officer of the court to sort of witness uh, the execution of certain documents where significant levels of capital or, or risk is at stake, which is, which is understandable. Um, but having to print those documents off and maybe uh, trot across Dublin and you know, make a ton of phone calls and, and pay this individual in cash just seems to be really, really disappointing to me. <laughs> and just a bit soul destroying. And also like has very little to do with keeping the wheels of justice going, you know, is actually leading to this inflated kind of timesheet, you know, every day for, for, for lawyers who just quite frankly have other things to be doing with their life as well. You know, we, there's only so many hours in the day where, where you can really, you know, focus on a task. So eliminating all of that sort of um, unnecessary stuff. And so, um, but then I started looking at the, the law itself and that despondency I was, uh, you know, mentioned earlier, it, you know, it's manifested here in Ireland and across the world, you know, our, our legislation that governs the execution of online contracts, the e-commerce act is 20 years old. Um, and so the first Othello product, I kind of, I, I did a ton of case studies and reckoned that it would be, you know, a lead in time of about six to eight years before the technology would actually be sort of adopted because the e-commerce act actually expressly carves these documents, these important documents, um, out of the benefit of technology. You know, they're just expressly carved out 
as important documents that require those substrates like paper form, face-to-face -face meeting. And, and of course that's understandable uh, a very long time ago, but now it just, it seems, uh, it seems gravely outdated and something that we're doing something about, but, but just, I'll, and I'll, I'll wrap this up because it's just um, to, to answer your point, we built our first product around that outdated legislation because I, I, I would have preferred to actually get some sort of traction and prove something out and drop it if it wasn't working, then sort of uh, sit and ponder of how to sort of little old me uh, take on, you know, the, <laughs> the legislators off the bat. So look, yeah. that, that was sort of um, the first product. And, and that's since actually been wound up, uh, but it was very useful in the early days, um, you know, to create the database of lawyers, prove that there was an appetite to use technology to get this thing done. And then, on a more exciting level, you know, target some really important documents that are sort of like globally, there are these cultural layers to and really try to go on the road to tidying that up. Interesting. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So the, the, the product now, um, what, what's the, the focus of that? And is that still in, um, is that still in connection with these uh, like legal barriers? That we're uh, Yes, absolutely. Uh, there's an order of magnitude uh, left to go. If in 2015, e-signing itself of basic contracts is becoming acceptable and, you know, the existence of the incumbents like, you know, DocuSign and, uh, and LowSign and all of that, um, you know, that's fantastic, you know, and, and they're really chomping up, you know, a ton of inefficiencies at a rate of knots, you know, and, and DocuSign are a publicly listed company. And that's all great. But uh, like I said, you know, these cultural layers to like so many documents within any given sort of important transaction, especially the ones that are underpinning the movement of significant levels of money or capital or assets is like, it's, it's, it's huge. Um, you know, you have to go through, take in India, for example, you have to go through a ton of protagonists in order to get something notarized. And it usually happens in this back office where, which stores documents of like 300 years old. 25% of the cost of getting started and doing business in Indonesia are notary and certification and legal services. So, um, and it's just different everywhere. And so we started where there may be a thousand reasons why you need to get something notarized or, um, you know, certified by an officer of the court or approved. Um, and we gave, you know, we solved the sort of booking and payment side of it with the first product. We kind of thought, okay, Let's, let's focus on this document type um, and let's try to move for, let's say if there's thousands of reasons why you need to get a document notarized, let's focus on one or two where we have the greatest chance of fully capturing like end-to-end -end digital process. And we sort of built that from there. And that, that was the reason behind uh, going to London for a while. Uh, we teamed up with Techstars and Barclays. We did an accelerator, which <clears throat> it was, the true Oxford English Dictionary uh, definition of accelerator. It was like genuinely the, 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 the busiest, definitely at, it was at the ceiling of what I could handle at any given moment, but it was critical because it enabled us to move from a two-sided find, book and pay for notary services app um, to a sort of fully digital end-to-end -end solution for the legal certification of certain documents that are important to the financial system and have global um, applicability. And from there, we will go on, you know, to, to move the needle with the legislators and everything else because, uh, yeah. While, while you were saying this, talking about India, talking about Indonesia, like, like America, all the, the, the potential of this type of business, it, the, the the pain there is everywhere all, all over the world a huge me this is crazy i love this mark yeah. What do you think? yeah yeah no it's super i think it's it's quite common that um people within an industry who maybe aren't typical entrepreneurs or aren't tech developers tend to find a solution and it, it seems to happen time and time again if you weren't a solicitor you wouldn't have been able to come up with this business i'd imagine so to go yeah. because of the knowledge that you have and you saw the pain points firsthand um but to go back to the product development, how do you start to actually create this product if you're not a tech person? I always think every great entrepreneur should have a little tech buddy or a tech partner. Me and Luke have talked about that in, in the past. 
Yeah. Who do we know? Who do we know? So if there's any tech guys or girls out there, give us a show. Yeah, holler, holler. Likewise, we're actually we're actually going to be hiring uh, quite soon, so that will be. But anyway, uh, that's another uh, day's work. Um, so I don't have a technical co-founder, and it's almost like the elephant in the room, you know, because you you need you know. Uh, you need a, a technical co-founder, I believe. You know, and like, I, I believe the progress of where we're at in terms of product market fit and everything else would have been the lead in time would have been a lot quicker by a technical co-founder. End okay. of. Um, so there were things that I navigated at the beginning. I learned just like an enormous amount. Uh, you know, because the, and, and I, I did, I, I met, um, you know, a couple of people connected with, with NDRC, um, Dermot Casey, Dermot Daly, who were enormously helpful in, and probably quite forgiving in my sort of lack of knowledge of, of technology itself, because I was, I was teaching myself as I was going along, had decided, right, this has to be what the first product looks like, you know, a long time before that. And then as you say, Mark, you know, uh, developing it is, is quite another thing. And um, so I, you know, I, I, I met people, talked to a lot of people, decided to build out a prototype of an agency, um, you know, moved sort of from pillar to post, you know, with different providers and, and stuff like that. Um, until finally sort of last year landing on, on the right mix in terms of tech development. And now we finally built out and fully wrapped up our, our, our two products, which are, you know, the end to end digital notary booking portal and an a signing API that supports all of that for the completion of other documents and for the use of our lawyers and notaries that provide services on, on, on the booking portal. But it was a long and bumpy and is that, journey. Sorry, Jennifer, is that a website and an app? Is that the way it works? Yeah, well, we're, we, we integrate with clients who have native applications, but we've actually, we, we don't have a native application play. It's sort of mobile responsive, um, you know, and, and desktop based, uh, you know, in, in the sense of, like typically when people are uploading a, a document, it's, it's the, the habits are in, are in, are in desktop. Um, and, you know, a lot of lawyers are still operating off desktop as well, even though I quite like the, I quite like um, just within the signing API, the ability to just like very quickly sign, you know, on your mobile or whatever. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, so, you know, it was just this journey of product market fit and, you know, also finding the right people to team up with on a technical basis. And we finally, like I said, hit the sweet spot and, I think, you know, going to London and engaging with, you know, the network over there really helped, you know, learn lots of other things. But, and you can pick it up because when you're passionate enough about your product, you start educating yourself fair, and the bills are coming in, you start educating yourself fairly lively as to what's the back end infrastructure, you know, what's, pen, what's a pen test, what are all these things? And you actually start to become, and it's quite nice and it's really refreshing because, Although you have to have the humility uh, to know that often the less you tell a good developer, the better. Um, and inflating, uh, in, inflating the sort of what you need um, or, or in, inflating it like, you know, with too many examples or words or suggestions is, is not a good idea. And I encountered that problem, you know, previously where I felt like, you know, there were, as a, as a team, we were juggling kind of too many instructions coming in at an engineer who actually, if you explain things on quite a high level and they understand the business, then, you know, you often get a lot better results. So it is, it's a learning curve. It really, really is. Um, I'm Sorry, kind of, I'm actually now, I'm really glad that those times are over, to be honest with you. <laughs> Uh, look, any anything you learn, you know, is new things like that are always going to be be a challenge. Were you a, were you a techie kind of person before then, or before you started? Um, yeah, I loved the computer. I remember we got dial up. Um, I think it was like I can't remember. It was way. It was even before like the days of Bebo or anything, and we got a PC. 
and I was just obsessed with it. I remember playing Dilbert's Donuts <laughs> on PC and I think mom probably checking in on me every now and again going, oh God, <laughs> what am I wearing? Uh, but I found it, I did, I did love it. And I just, I loved, I was fascinated by the ability to sort of uh, bring this blank piece of paper up in front of you and do whatever you wanted to with it, you know? Um, but the dial-up was really, I, I remember, especially in Rena's Green at West Cork, you know, it was quite um, sparky, but uh, yeah, I loved it. And then, you know, I, I was kind of into music as well. And, you know, you buy a CD and it would give you the ability to sort of edit and crop videos and stuff. And you sort of love playing around with all of that. Um, so definitely from a younger age, uh, I just enjoyed computers and, uh, but, but not in a very, I mean, you know, I didn't, I didn't go off and learn how to code or anything like that. I actually remember a friend of mine, Daniel Loftus got great advice from him. There was a time when I was considering learning how to code and I was so in deep with the business plan and trying to reach product market fit. Um, and I think like he kind of looked at me, I was just mentioned and I was like, maybe this would be an option. And, uh, you know, he sort of looked at me, uh, you know, like I had two heads and readjusted his glasses. He's like, that would be an unmitigated disaster. <laughs> and I'm actually, <laughs> I'm actually really glad that I didn't go and do that because there's only, you have, you have to do what you do um, and know what you don't know and, and leave the rest to the experts. I think that's great advice because we, at the beginning of this, we were, we didn't really know where this uh, podcast was going when we first started. So we were like reading books and doing like, we did a couple of like kind of book reviews and so I don't know what we're doing. But anyway, uh, we read this book, The, um, the E-Myth uh, Revisited. And it was about that where you're just kind of putting the right people in the right place. That's really what your job is as a business owner. So it's not so much trying to be uh, the best marketing executive, the best, um, you know, COO, the best, you know, we're just building those those roles out and filling them with experts is the is the key you know i, I think yeah. entrepreneurs are quite inquisitive though and want to know you know want to learn all the time i know i am so i i'm constantly fighting against that trying to get too involved in every single area of the business that i do there's absolutely no need for me it's a skill in itself to actually learn to to delegate and to to maybe not go deep into every single area because there is only so many hours in the day exactly yeah especially when it would just capitulate your business uh, you know, as an unexperienced person trying to, to learn yeah. a new skill like that off the bat. But yeah, Mark, I think I think as well, and maybe, I don't know, you're from a professional services background, I think, you know, as well, maybe it was sort of like drummed into me a little bit uh, where you have to look, you know, for the why of everything and you just need to learn where to let go at some point. And there's a really mm. healthy balance. Something that I've gotten a lot better at uh, and something that was not uh, as, as natural to me, I guess, in the early days. Well. So just, just to go back to the, the timeline, which is, it's a big thing around um, what well, a, lot, a lot of kind of entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs are thinking, when is the right time to actually jump ship and, and leave your, your, your permanent job? You know, that's burn the, the boats, biggest, you know, <laughs> yeah, burn the boats, you know, at what stage, and how far into your career were you when you were actually building the product and then when did you actually go all in? Um, well, I, I went all in from the moment that I sort of landed on the, you know, I was just sort of thinking, 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 and then this sort of find, book and pay for the services as a starting point to create a community and a database of lawyers and notaries willing to do things a little bit differently and try to see how that would work. Like the minute that that sort of thing uh, settled, uh, that, that was it really. Um, I think when you know, you know. Um, I, I sort of... Um, how hard was that decision? To finish up was, as a, as a, a practice? It, it was more of an emotional, it, it was more of an emotional thing. It was like breaking up with a career in law, you know, you're sort of breaking up with the all the nice things that come with it as well. Do you know what I mean? Well, like... But you're in a way, in a way you're still, you're staying friends with it as well though. Well, yeah, exactly. But you're, you're breaking up with what you sort of, uh, you know, worked quite hard to, to, to 
get to or whatever. But I think, you know, if I could go, go back, uh, you know, in time, I would like allow myself to think outside the box a little bit more because, you know, it, well, it's chicken and egg because I think I'm very lucky to have done the hard graft or whatever. Uh, and I don't regret a minute of that. But at the same time, the decision itself wasn't uh, that difficult when, when the right sort of, the right thing came along, the right feeling and the right momentum came along. It would have been sort of like, it felt like there was no other option at one stage because I, I went and I met a couple of sort of early stage investors um, just in Dublin and it was sort of like right when are you giving up your day job and that's when it kind of became real because you do as well there's a confidence issue and um, you know I was really confident in in what I was doing and um, you know in my professional career and then it's sort of the fear of the unknown and stuff but in balance you know it, it seemed like a, a really sensible thing to do and sort of like why not you know that the momentum was there and um, and I was sort of really excited about it. So uh, it made sense, you know, from there for sure. Um, it's interesting yeah. that excited was a, it's a really uh, powerful thing as well. How many people are excited about their career? I think that's a big, it's a big gap out there. I, I, I don't know, I speak to a lot of my friends and not a lot of them are like, oh, I, I can't wait to get after that tomorrow, you know? So that kind of excitement, that's, that's worth a lot as well. When you, so you met with some, some of the investors, is that the time when you were saying, okay, uh, maybe London is a, a good place to go, the accelerator program? There'll be a lot of people, like Mark said, that are listening to this, that are starting businesses or thinking of starting businesses. There's all these different routes. There's complete bootstrapping. There's uh, going to acceler accelerator programs or incubators, those type of things. But like what... How did that come on your radar and how did that happen? Okay, um, so I had, I, had, I had a chat with um, Chris Adelsbach, who is the former uh, MD of the Barclays Techstars um, Accelerator. And I had a chat with, I didn't really think about fintech in 2017. I was more concerned with, you know, it's taking us an hour to on board a notary and it's taking me actually just physically on board you know in terms of doing the kyc and the checks and everything else and when i think about how that that world even alone has come on uh in three or four years it's like insane like we we now directly integrate with ID and the apps where it's literally done you know biometrics and everything else and the kyc and, and compliance piece um, and verification of identity is done in a click. So, you know, the, these are all of the, like, the difficulties and because we had like payments, you know, in, in the first original app and everything else. My major concern was like, how do I, okay, I've put in the long hours with, with one of these notaries, we're ready to onboard. How do I like, how do we even manage onboarding them? Like it was, it was all these like really like basic things on like efficiencies and, just figuring really, really, really basic stuff out. I wasn't ready to think about, I, I was just thinking about product market fit. I wasn't thinking about and, and a good product and someone, you know, to have, you know, one and two and maybe 10 people say something good about the product. So the, the broader opportunity I sort of like had put to the back of my mind the minute that the distraction of an actual, uh, you know, real life functioning proposition uh, came to play. I just sort of like, um, furloughed the, the 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 massive global opportunity that I knew was out there, sort of for a little while. And uh, but Chris came on my radar, and we had a chat about fintech. And uh, I just remember coming away from the call, going, "Okay, it just it just allowed me to think a little bit differently about how we could reach sort of like a scalable." Um, that we could like reach a nice little niche, you know, before raising further capital or anything like that. And uh, just opened my mind a little bit to the financial services industry, which is also in ripe, uh, you know, ripe for sort of, you know, some help on how processes are ran and stuff like that. Because like pay, pay, online payments is like, you know, well on its way to being solved, but the internal issues within a bank um, and the enormous volume even of documents that they have to cope with, 
yeah. is, you know, it's, it's still just, it's like quite literally white space that needs to be tackled. And, uh, you know, I, I wanted something that could actually, it, it, what the move to London and, and the chat with Chris uh, did for me was, um, you know, enable us to go from a sort of two-sided marketplace app, which didn't sit, like I knew it was necessary, but it didn't sit too well with me for the longer term. Um, like I said, you know, for many reasons around, you know, the legislative change and all the rest, um, it enables us to go from a two-sided uh, marketplace, which can be painfully difficult to scale, even at the best times. Um, anyway, even if you take it in another vertical, it, it, it didn't sit comfortably with me for, for what we're doing even, but, you know, for the longer term. But even if you take that into another vertical, it's painfully difficult to scale and make success of. So it enables us to sort of um, move from sort of two-sided marketplace into a more um, sort of just stickier uh, proposition that we could sort of um, really attach ourselves on to certain sort of niche transactions on a repeatable basis. And, you know, the fruits of that are really, have really only been boring at the beginning of this year. You know, we finally, um, we've integrated with uh, one of the world's largest financial consulting groups to reach their clients in 60 countries. And that integration finished up last week. So, I mean, you know, and we're, 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 we're actually scoring the sort of deals that would have been imagined when I first chatted to Chris in 2018. Um, yeah. yeah, so it, take, it took a while, but I'm, I'm like, it was an eye opener into the banking space because I remember, so I had the initial chat and I parked it in the back of my mind. And then I came back to it because I got a call from, Chris was in town and I got a call uh, from another investee company saying, oh, you should, you guys should meet up. And then, and then it all happened very quickly from there. Just like um, I decided to make the application process. That was a very busy Christmas, a uh, very busy January. And I went over for interview and we pitched uh, at one Churchill place in Canary Wharf. And uh, I had been told by some of the people at Techstars that it was going to be an interview, right? So I was sort of like thinking, okay, great. Uh, you know, just, I guess, you know, brought my pitch deck and happy okay. out. And I, I was put into like a, a side kitchen with a couple of other prospective companies. And uh, one, of, one, of, one of the girls that was there, um, Madeline Blythe and she kindly they were serving lunch and everything and she kindly um, I remember removed uh, I, I was ha sort of having a sandwich out of sheer nerves and she was sort of like fixed me up before going in but uh, and the nerves actually came from realising that there was like 28 people in a large uh, boardroom when I sort of looked sideways um, and so like you know and they came for stakeholders from Techstars, Barclays and all the rest so I suppose it, it, was, uh, it was good training for what was to come, put it that way. Um, but that, that's how it all came about. And I suppose, uh, you know, haven't looked back since, you know, it was a great decision. So when you went into that, into that boardroom, what happened? What, way, what kind of structure of the interview or, or whatever it was? Tell us a bit more about that. I mean, they, they want to tackle the business plan, right? And they're coming up from, uh, from a lot of different angles, uh, like any investor or partnership, you know, would, would necessitate. So um, really a broader, broader discussion around the opportunity and how to reach it. Um, and how, know, much, how much did they know about, about your business before they spoke quite to you? A bit, quite a bit. Uh, that would have been at the very final application stages. So we would have been, you know, a couple of months in um, sort of like mini due diligence or, uh, you know, application process. And it's quite competitive. I only realized afterwards, you know, it's, it's really competitive. It was the, the, the mentors and the ability to connect with some like incredible people in FinTech and the banking system were the reasons for us applying. But it, um, you know, it, I realized afterwards how sought after and, and, that, and that was like enough for me. That was like enormous enough uh, for me and important enough to just be like, yeah, we really need this. The time is right. Uh, um, but it, it's, it's so competitive for many other reasons. Uh, you know, there's whether, you know, some companies 
you know, want to get onto that accelerator program to score their first large banking contract. You know, they're creating like some really cool efficiencies for, for banks, you know, in AI and many other different like interesting spaces. So everybody has like a different motive, which makes the whole process quite competitive. But um, it, it was really, it was a good call. Was there, is there any equivalent in, in Dublin or, or Ireland for, for, for that? accelerators no no so is, is it a case of like a music band going to london to make it is is that is that the way it seems i don't know it's it's certainly not as glamorous as that <laughs> but, no, but opportunity wise market wise you know i assume that that's the reason opportunity wise i would say you know there are conversations that i had and things that i've learned and um, that you know it, it's a it, it was an extremely rich source in our product uh, journey and mm. um, so i would say it was a really really good call from that regard but L- london is dublin and london like i think you know i i moved back to dublin because you know i just sort of prefer living there uh you know for the time being and uh um, you know, but London, Dublin and London are equally uh, great for doing business. You know what I mean? It just, in my in my opinion, anyway. I think though, in London, what really struck me was the diversity um, in in opinion, and the, and I think it's actually just down to um, you know, like the population, and, and it's just truly diverse. You know, they say you mm. haven't lived lived in London um not How long sure you been uh, I was over there for 18 months okay so it's a good old stretch like for sure yeah and that's yeah. when you're when you're in the accelerator it's a, the first is the first day is it kind of like almost going to like a university or something do you all go in like as a, the class of 2019 or something and then they tell you exactly how you should structure your company I was wondering is it just a place to work and there's a little bit of coaching or are they super hands-on at that stage do you know that way super hands-on um, and okay. yeah it operates sort of as a mini corporation for a while and you can take it or leave it I mean I know that some companies would have been at a further stage where they're more interested in um, you know having discussions with the banking community and and reaching product market fit in in you know within like a certain tier one bank you know which is an entirely different thing to actually figuring out what your product should look like and what 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 it's going to be targeting first but you know see you're very much if you're at the earlier stages going in it operates really as a very tight-knit uh support um which i think is good for first-time founders and it's probably just uh uh, it, it was just a really, really good call, um, you know, for me. And I think a lot of a lot of people would share that feedback. There's just everyone will like take something different uh, from it. But yeah, it was it was a very intense space. The Rise Building in London, which is we we had office space there, you know, for that period in in in, in London, and uh, it's real. It's it's really high octane, and uh, yeah, some great memories uh, from there. And um, you know a, lo- a lot of hard work, but you know it was it was a great great part of the journey. It sounds like an amazing experience. Um, something that a lot of people don't even take advantage of. Us, me and Mark have said this on the podcast a few times. How we like Ireland is obviously a very small uh, market, but like one, everyone in North America speaks English, so we can sell to those guys. Um, and uh, the UK is I I can see Wales from my house uh, sometimes. You know from the. Yeah. Yeah, on a clear day, yeah. Um, so anyway, actually one of my friends came up here and we were looking out the window when I got to the house and um, she said, I told them, you know, one, some days you can see whales and then she's like, oh my God, those whales must be huge. She thought I was talking about actual <laughs> whales. <laughs> uh, okay, so anyway, uh, sidebar there. But, okay, so, sure. Well, yeah. I actually, uh, yeah, shark, shark, sharks are okay. They're yeah. kind of like, yeah. But are they're you really saying good. that because you're on the shark pod, yeah? Possibly, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what's so we're we're coming up on, on on fifty minutes here. We want to get some uh, quick fire questions in. But what's what's next? What's the future for Othello now? Are is there going to be uh, big 
launches of new products is just going to be honing in on the products that you have. What's the, what's the vision here? Yeah. So, uh, like I said, look, you know, that there's an order of magnitude to go in, in this market where we believe, you know, that, uh, you know, specialized contracts and legal services and everything else need a lot of tidying up. And we finally sort of landed on the two products that are going to be the most useful in that, in, 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 in that goal. Um, yeah. and so, you know, we, getting that international reach since the beginning of the year has been fantastic it's targeting you know the uae and um, new countries in europe and um, so that's all really exciting for us you know to think that you know a customer can now get you know their kyc or anti-money laundering documents notarized or certified for international use and um, you know from the touch of a button and the comfort of their own home um, that's really cool. But like I said, that is a niche because the, the, wor the weird and wonderful world of paperwork holds a ton more really complex processes. And like a power of attorney, for example, is a super high risk document, cannot be notarized digitally. Um, that is the opinion of, of all of the notary bodies. And we have this respectful balancing act, you know, it means to play a lot of the time. Um, and so that's gonna be a very exciting journey moving forward. But for the short term to medium term, it's just, enjoying a uh, product market fit and because we were finally at a place and with the signing api which is a spin-off essentially of targeting notarizations and legal certifications we have you know world-class signing api which um you know has replaced incumbents in for some you know startups we're really targeting um high growth exciting insure techs legal techs fintechs who don't want necessarily to work with an incumbent who sort of gets in their own way in terms of charging on a per tech basis, which might stifle growth or um, not be aware that the way signatures are applied are not necessarily, you know, the best thing for the banking system or the financial system. So we have like a nice, you know, target group of those customers as well. And, um, you know, and, and we're getting great feedback and rich sources of feedback. So on the two products, there's a sort of a really, really, really great things happening that I'm excited about. And um, yeah, it's interesting because I haven't thought back in a while and it's really interesting chatting today. Um, and yeah, it's, it's just, it's so definitely, you know, having, because I think I mentioned earlier, you know, the most important thing is that you have one or two customers saying really, really good things about you. And then that just multiplies up. And, and finally, we're experiencing that now, you know, um, and just looking forward to that sort of um, shorter to medium term. And then maybe the, the legislators and, um, you know, help, helping people, helping the poor people in Indonesia as well um, might be on the longer agenda. We're losing sleep over these Indonesians with their high, uh, with their high paperwork um, the burden. And just, we're going to fix just it. Just one thing. Sorry, Luke. Um, just about, like, you've obviously focused on the legal sector and, and the fintechs. When we spoke the other day, I think I was trying to get a prescription for one of my, one of my kids and the doctor had to fax it over to Boots for them, they wouldn't take a, a scanned, even a scanned document of a signature. It had to be a fax. That really annoyed me in 2020. Have you thought of, of opportunities in the medical sector? In, mm -hmm. Or is that just kind of too far, thinking too, too broadly right now? No, I, th I, no, I think that's absolutely possible. You know, with the right sort of strategic partnerships, you know, we, we, we don't like put anything into marketing, you know, per se. All of our growth has been really organic because it's like the richest source really of, of how you're bringing a product to market. Um, so with that in mind, it's not something that we've actually touched on or sort of, you know, put it out there in front of lots of different verticals. But what's really interesting about professional services and, you know, the developments happening in telemedicines, for example, we can see things going the same route with, with the provision of legal services. And so, you know, there is definitely um, a part to play there in the broader sort of matrix of professional services as well, in terms of just providing a more two-sided, you know, secure and customer-friendly, um, 
you know, way of, of completing those types of documents as well. Um, so it's definitely something that, you know, needs to be tackled in the future. So, and, and actually you really, you brought it sort of to the fore of my mind. It's, it's always good to sort of look at other verticals and, uh, and um, the exciting possibilities that there, because I, I think actually, um, you know, word facsimile, I know we, I used to joke with um, my, my counterparts, my, my colleagues, you know, in law, you know, the word facsimile needs to be moved from every contract worldwide. I don't know anyone who, you know, wants to be dealing with sending notices or, uh, or, or receiving things and that type of thing on a contractual or legal basis through fax. So maybe we can put that on the list as well. <laughs> so we've got lots of opportunities that we're just coming up with here. Like it seems like there's like while you're talking, while Mark's talking there, I'm just thinking about the possibilities for like so much paperwork that's going to be going away in the next twenty years. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So, so, so Othello is a really it's a really green friendly business. So you're saving saving a lot of trees. Yeah, exactly. You know, yeah, possibly. Yeah, I mean, um, I think the consumption of paper and stuff is 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 to the fore of people's minds um it's definitely a nice uh spin you know it, it, it's a nice benefit of, of what we're doing yeah definitely look we're, we're a new business uh, my recruitment business is a year and a half old and we said we'd be paperless and because we started from scratch we are paperless we have no we've barely any paper i got i got 500 sheets headed paper because every business has to do that you actually have to do that to to get approved for a VAT or something like that. Anyway, you yeah. have to have a headed paper and stuff. But uh, I don't, I don't, I don't think we've even used it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We have no place for it. it. It looks a lot prettier on the screen than yeah. you. <laughs> think, think about this though, guys. This is, you were talking about dial up there recently, or I remember I got uh, broadband. I think I was in like fifth year when I got broadband. That's how recent this is. So and it's speeding up. Do you know? So all of these uh, improvements yeah. with um, with the paperwork and all the improvements that we can do uh, it's I'm not, yeah very much so do you feel, jennifer do, sorry luke do you, do you feel like it is a bit of a race like it's like there's a load of seeds there and people are pouring water on them and then once they sprout it's kind of like people realize oh that's a thing and now what you're doing is obviously so important and and so lucrative and so needed is it a race now are you do you feel like you're in a race to, to get there as quick as possible Oh, oh well, I mean, everything, everything, everything to some degree, there's, there's a sense of urgency in everything you do, everything important that you do. Um, mm. and, that, and that's for everyone to decide. Um, but it's such a good idea and it's so needed, you know, well, I assume there will be competitors, you know, like everything else. Uh, it's just, I think there is an or, orders of magnitude left to go here in and, and, you know, there's, you know, the, the law in general. And when I look at like some, some legal texts and again, we're more, I think, a utility sort of, uh, you know, with, with a hybrid sort of like legal utility, you know, financial sort of um, play. But, um, you know, there's, it's quite white space, you know, pardon the pun. I think there, there, there is just... Uh, vast amounts of improvements to 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 happen um, everywhere we look uh, globally. Um, so, a lot of entrepreneurs we talk to as well don't really believe in the competition uh, as well. It's just like, well, I'm just going to do my own thing and we'll we'll get there in the end. Like Mark saying that, but he's he started a business in maybe the most competitive space in Ireland. Every like, there's so many recruit recruiting things out there when we were. Uh, looking at that so and you're doing just fine so um so what's the what, what's the the story with these lightning round uh, questions here lightning round we yeah i don't have really a name for this but uh it's it's, it's oh, no I thought, I thought i was off the hook guys <laughs> <laughs> no so, quick fire questions but you can elaborate on any uh, as you go um so what apps do you use the most yourself um youtube uh, I think at the moment it's a bit of a it's a great source of information. It's also a huge distraction. Uh, it can be a real rabbit hole. Uh, but yeah, I quite like I find myself you know tapping into a range of of different things. You can go from the most recent interview with Warren Buffett to like 
some sort of ex obscure what I eat in a day from you know someone you've never heard of. Uh, but yeah, I'd have to say you do. Cool. What's your favorite social media and why? Um, am I allowed to just say YouTube? I think I feel mm -hmm. like I'm actually teetering on deletion of social, some social media apps like all of the time at this stage. I, I don't know. I think like a few of them are probably due to implode in some way, shape or form in terms of the value that they're adding. Um, although I enjoy Instagram, I think it's become more of an e-commerce platform. Uh, um, you know, Twitter sort of looks like it will either explode or implode at any given moment these days because of everything that's going on with world events. But, so you know, they're very dissatisfied with the media and I know there's a place for for Twitter. So that's still, you know, a very it's almost supplanting media in in a meaningful way, uh, if and when you're able for it. So you know I think it, limiting social media um where you can is actually mm -hmm. The name of the game because we're all like our emotional and logical brains are now very much entangled with um with this I, my my sister's fiance is reading a book at the moment called how to break up with your phone okay. um, <laughs> and i think that is they could there could be a thesis on each individual social media platform uh worthy worthy of a book there as well potentially yeah. so I'll I, I think it's sorry go we ahead I'll stick with YouTube as, as less intrusive and, and Spotify as well. I adore and the algorithms and stuff around the music is, um, is really good. Cool. I, I feel it's a constant battle between the benefit that you're getting and then the harm it's doing to you on whether it's Twitter or anything. If there's an app out there that hasn't been created, I think it's a good idea. I'd use it that would kind of, that you could apply that filters all your social media, filters out all, anything you don't want to see. And uh, that'd be, I'd love Twitter that I only like, you know, it's a bit of AI where they know if it's negative or not. Yeah, <laughs> surely that's, yeah. Well, yeah. In the pie, <laughs> guys, I, I might be marking this day. <laughs> yeah, exactly. um, yeah, I'll have a think about that. I'm not doing anything else. Think about okay, that. next one. Um, what's the best business idea that you never acted upon? Um, it's probably... Something over time, my first like real job um, when I was doing my entrance exams and stuff was um, was working at quite a large bank. It didn't have a retail arm at the time, but it was like quite a sizable bank um, in Dublin. And I was in a fledgling uh, regulatory group who were just sort of like really taking taking note and taking real stock of you know, what was expected of the bank from a regulatory perspective. And there were these letters coming in um, from Central Bank at the time. And I just remember thinking, oh, this is, you know, so tough on the bank and it's disastrous because some really important like decisions being made that are going to affect the way the bank can do business. And they're coming in in letter form, but they are in effect law. Um, and, you know, and there's interesting like, you know, there's all of this paperwork that sort of goes amiss, but it's of like, you know, extreme importance to any given, given organization or individual. And then when I went into practice, I realized that there was a ton of really valuable court documents just sitting offline. Um, and so, you know, capturing all of these documents with the purpose of creating this sort of API for law, which assist in the provision of legal services because often Google, even as a lawyer on the highest end, um, Google can be a great aid. It can be a super rich source. It can be, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so some sort of like searchable um, API for law. And, but like, and that's what I mean about white space. There is just a, a, ma a magnitude of, uh, there's a world of things to be done out there, but like, you know, a searchable engine for like any types of data or documents um, and data sets that you may need for the provision of legal services, because there is always that human necessary element for most cases and transactions. But that in itself has been acted upon by many, you know, really cool startups, some of, some of whom are in Ireland, you know, in the legal sex space, they're either targeting, you know, courts or employment and, you know, in really, really interesting ways. So I, I, I'm a huge fan of, of companies who are doing that. 
um, because it would it ultimately benefits you know the lawyers and the consumers and everyone. Um, yeah, so I, accurate data is power. So yeah. I think that's a great idea. I think maybe Mark's best uh, idea he never worked on was like, you know, selling something. I don't know. Well, not very, uh, not very in-depth. Like that. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't expecting yeah. something as in-depth as that. Yeah, great answer. Mark, maybe two more. Is that your, your daughter's chiming in? <laughs> yeah, she's trying to take part here. Um, how much money is enough money? How much money is enough money? Um... Um, I think we're all, yeah, like we're, we're all on this sort of like, um, you know, more and more and more, it's sort of like, and that's really like, uh, encouraged by social media as well. Like comparison can be a bit of a dream killer. You know, everyone wants more. It's going to be more and more and more. We're on this sort of like hedonic treadmill, like, you know, the minute that you reach one milestone and you know, you're earning 30,000 then what if it's going to be 60,000 and then you know what I mean it's just um but but really I think for me or or just looking at things more generally um you know it, there, enough money to put a roof over one's head um I think we're facing like globally a real crisis around security of tenure um, and access to housing. I mean, it's, it's patently obvious in cities like San Francisco, even though I've not been lucky enough to go there yet, but hopefully when things, when things go back to normal, you know, it's, I hear it's patently obvious in cities like San Francisco. Yeah. Um, and, but it's also an issue in, in every urban center, uh, you know, like, and, and there's a compounded effect, I think, since the last property recession where, security of tenure, you know, restrictions to access of security of tenure and using like land and property and um, not for like the output of that land or property, but the, you know, more just using it as just a yield for the use of it, you know, by a landlord or, you know, the various debt implications and banking implications and everything is having a crushing effect on society. And I think ownership of land um, or property um, in, in, in more thought out ways, um, is really important. And, and for that reason, I think, you know, enough money to have, have your own place, uh, you know, without too much restrictions. There's, there's a really interesting book, How Asia Works, that I'm, I'm reading at the moment. And, and it studies land reform and the distribution of property where, you know, one of the key um, one one of the key separators um, in terms of economic growth and output in in Far East Asia, in terms of countries that have really been successful in growing, um, you know, was the distribution of land and allowing people to sort of own their own land and grow their own crops and. I mean, it, it's not just uh, in rural areas that increasing output can be a good starting point, but also I think in city areas, because we're all now converting our homes into offices. And so the output that can actually come from that is enormous. But, you know, history dictates that when you put the crunch down on, you know, your... Um, your, your, your access or, or just restricting access to, to that comfort in any way, whether monetarily or anything else, can, can really affect things negatively. So I, housing is a big thing of, of mine. Um, yeah. I and I, I, I think that would, that would be the natural, that is my natural, uh, that, that's sort of like the money in housing yeah. is like, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think on Maslow's hierarchy of needs, I think I think housing or a place to live, I assume, is one of them. And that's all the basic Great. stuff. But like the basic stuff is actually so difficult to to achieve nowadays. So housing, like, I think, and, and then therefore you feel everybody feels like they have to earn a lot of money to get the basic needs. So there's a big there's a big issue there. The housing thing is such an interesting thing. So like I like us, one of my friends bought a house uh, recently, and he's I think he's thirty, uh, but it was still a big deal. Everyone's like, oh my God, he's got a house. Like, but like our parents, uh, they all, a lot of them had houses. They could afford houses if they just had a, a decent job when they were 21, 22. Do you know what I mean? 
So and, and that is largely owing to, I mean, like, you know, I believe since, since the freedom of our state, you know, from, from imperialism and, and the, the focus on land ownership and organic growth and output within rural areas gave, you know, the generation ahead of us, like, so much... Um, we were really lucky to be born into this generation where that was possible. And I think, unfortunately, that is that it, we're slowly but surely losing grip of that, I think, at the moment with the distortion of supply and demand on housing and stuff. And I just I don't want to see this country going down that route. Um, I think uh, working from home, you know, whereas it mightn't be fully healthy to, to be working in, you know, your box room every every day, but, you know, partly working from home, some people will be will be able to live you know, outside of Dublin and, and the prices will come down. I do think that's going to happen. You know, yeah. people from wherever, you know, Longford, the Midlands are going to be working, getting taking jobs in Dublin, which is great. And they don't have to move in because the prices are just scandalous. Here's, an, yeah. here's another business idea just on the back of this. Like we're having a lot of problems right now because a lot of our, uh, in HubSpot, a lot of our uh, staff are international. Like I've, Almost everybody seems to be from somewhere uh, in there, which is great. But a lot of them are like either stuck in Italy or stuck in, uh, you know, like wherever they're from because they went home during the lockdown or whatever and they can't really come back and that type of thing. And then there's all these legal impl- implications of that because oh, like the Dublin ent- or the Irish HubSpot entity can't pay them properly because of tax stuff, all this type of stuff. So there might be wow. some sort of business there to make that easier so people can work anywhere, do you know? Wow, I think I think there is one actually. Um, D, I think. Uh, let me see. I, the name The name of the company escapes me. There is an Irish company doing something about this, um, and there's also a. Oh God, the na- I, I I don't know. I can't. Um, I will ping you. Missed on the boat on that one, Luke. Yeah, I missed yeah. the boat. Damn. Okay. Okay. Anyway, Luke's okay, so- a great ideas man. Big ideas, man. Um, Mark, really yeah. <laughs> but, uh, okay, next, next one. Um, okay, what age do you plan to retire? Um, I don't. I, I don't think I'll ever fully retire. Uh, no, I think there'll always be something interesting to do, and uh, so you just yeah. do go on to the next thing. Um, I think well look when you do what you love you you don't work a day in your life is that what they say so yeah Yeah. well I think it's always about like being able to have the right balance so like you know in future probably be more important for me to you know be able to balance my time you know a little bit more and but you can always I think there's always there's always something interesting to do uh you know so yeah keep that excitement going um and you're and whatever you're doing that's kind of the, the key like i sent I sent talk about youtube earlier and going down rabbit holes and stuff because for some reason i've like i find these people who are having these incredible different lives for me and then you just go into exactly what they're doing i sent mark one yesterday i'm following this guy who's like a rancher in wyoming why do i why can't i turn off his videos it's not anything to do with, with the life i'm living but i'm like wow so i was like retired i'd, I'd love to do something like this <laughs> do you know what i mean i've yeah. uh, farm with the ranch anyway so mark let's bring it home one more question and then uh, we'll wrap it up okay right two more um is it who you know or what you know uh well i think okay so if like to answer that's like a binary you know, option um it's it's what you know because i think you know uh you know <laughs> sorry <laughs> um like every in a biz okay in a business context um you know the sorry um in a business context there's nothing you know that you can make happen really without knowledge and without like let's say if i think back of like you know studying law or going through and 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 qualifying and practicing and certainly sitting at my desk at any of those given stages what you know is like inherently important and it leads to everything else good leads from there and I think in business it can often be the same like I'm always usually who I know is down to 
what they've told me that I don't already know or vice versa and the exchange of information. Um, so I would say if I had to pick one would be what you know in personal life probably like who you know and who you choose not to know like and sort of guarding your time and and all of that and your energies um that's a very interesting question that's gonna have me spinning there for the day <laughs> <laughs> but every everybody has a different opinion because of the journey they've had so far so we're interested to see you yeah. know where where everybody has arrived at um okay last one if you could give advice to the 18 year old you what would it be um maybe i think you're we we maybe allowing allowing uh, yourself to uh chill out a bit more maybe you know like just allow yourself to be sort of unsure about what the plan is for a while can be i think fairly useful and um, because we can and i can see it more and more with like you know students as they're coming up through university and i did some work with them law students at ucc was lucky enough to go down there um it's like a year a year and a bit ago and had some really interesting chats with law students down there and there can be this very much like tunnel vision on you know the path again that hedonic treadmill like you know you're just like consistently running and going and going so pressing pause and like you know just taking a drink of water every now and again is like <laughs> without a reason to it's just like a good idea i guess um because it can you know being quite like thinking um vertically on on things you know and your life and your trajectory all, all the way can be limiting you know it can stagnate uh other things you know that might pass you by and um so maybe just to chill out a little bit more um yeah great advice i think for, for anyone and do you know, sometimes i think about that as well i think um if i look back five years ago i <laughs> this is i'm loving what i'm doing now but this wasn't my plan at all and <laughs> like so my yeah. whole uh, like the, the planning thing I, I think we put a lot of effort into that, but when you're 18, because you don't know what's going to happen. It's a, it's an absolute yeah. black box. So just chill out. I like that one. Um, yeah. Mark, are you finished up with the questions there? You all good? Yeah, no, look, one more. I, was, I wasn't going to answer, but I, I, I'll ask. If you could advise someone to learn one skill, what would it be? Oh, um, that is one, it has to be one skill. Yeah. You, you, this, this person has one skill they can't do anything else what would be the <laughs> that's, that's what I think about this it doesn't have to be business related it could be grow your own vegetables <laughs> brilliant and on that note uh, Jennifer it's been a delight thank you very much for joining us on the shark pod today people get out there grow your own vegetables um, but also start <laughs> Um, that's going to be the that might be the name of this podcast we're going to figure that out afterwards um, but thanks so much uh, Jennifer, for spending so much time with us this morning okay thanks, thanks Jennifer so lovely thank you bye 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 um, okay so I've stopped recording there <laughs>